Today's lecture will focus on health process models. Health process models are different from the social cognitive models we heard about in the last lecture because those models more or less try to predict or understand how do people uh, decide to engage or not engage in health behavior at any one point in time. Uh, these models, the process models, really try to understand how the process of change unfolds over time. What are the steps necessary or perhaps the stages people go through as they move from an old behavior into a new behavior? These models share a lot of uh, common elements with the social cognitive models. Many of those same factors, uh, things like self-efficacy, uh, show up and are certainly important in these models, but they do have more of the developmental perspective of unfolding over time. Uh, they incorporate those constructs and really help us understand when in that process those factors might be most important. The first model we can look at is one we call the health action process model. Uh, this model basically um, has two broad stages that people go through. A decision-making stage at the front end and then a stage of volitional action. Uh, that's the stage that is in the box on the right hand of the figure. The decision-making stage involves uh, developing goals and those goals as you can see are informed by things like self-efficacy, one's belief in what I'm capable of, outcome expectancies, my beliefs that if I do it certain valuable things will occur, and risk perception, how, uh, how important is the um, disease or illness I might be putting off by engaging in these uh, models. You might notice those three factors all showed up in the various social cognitive models we saw before, so not surprising. Uh, once goals are formed, people need to go through a planning process, deciding which behaviors done exactly when will be most necessary to change. And then people hopefully will move into an action uh, stage or a volitional action stage in which people are initiating a new behavior and then maintaining that behavior over time. The recovery box there refers to uh, the process that often people, when they're trying to adopt new behaviors, uh, think of your own New Year's resolutions as an example, uh, we often experience lapses or relapses where we fall back into old behaviors, the new behavior doesn't quite stick, and what we want people to do is to recover from that lapse, reinitiate the new behavior, and keep trying to maintain it. Uh, hopefully people leave this process with um, uh, disengagement, ideally because the process has been successfully completed, uh, but could also leave the process because they are discouraged and um, have given up on the behavior change. So as I mentioned, the two broad stages of decision-making and volitional action, uh, you notice the importance of outcome expectancies and perceptions of risk uh, in, making the, in the decision-making phase, but then the model predicts that self-efficacy beliefs are really important throughout the process, that at every single stage people need to have high self-efficacy or increase their self-efficacy in order to be most successful. The next process uh, model we can look at is called the precaution adoption model. This is a model that looks at the process whereby people decide to start taking precautionary behaviors. Again, those sort of behaviors like uh, perhaps uh, self-screening measures or engaging in um, health screening activities like checking one's cholesterol or checking blood pressure. Uh, this model predicts that people go through uh, six broad stages. Uh, at the beginning, they may be completely unaware of the issue. They don't have any idea that this is a health issue. They may uh, lack information about what it's all about. Uh, at stage two, they may be aware of it, but they're unengaged. Perhaps they don't see it as relevant to them personally, maybe because of their own age, maybe because of their gender or family history, but they just don't see it as really relevant to them. If individuals do realize it's relevant to them and become a bit more engaged, they then move into stage three, which is deciding about acting. Um, this process may look very much like uh, the model we just saw before, where things like outcome expectancies and risk perceptions um, could factor into that decision, and people then move into either deciding not to act or deciding to act. If they move into that decision to act, they, they then can move into the sixth stage, which is actually acting. You can think of the stage three, stage five, and stage six here as looking very much like the, the model we just saw previously, um, which had the two stages of decision making and then volitional acting. Ultimately, this model includes stage seven, which is maintenance. These are people who have initiated the new behavior, and we want them to move into maintenance where they're maintaining that new behavior over time. 
So this model is designed to understand how people come to adopt preventive behaviors. It describes discrete stages and the tasks that are needed to move from one stage to the next, which is uh, quite helpful. One of the criticisms is that compared to uh, the trans theoretical model, the next model we'll look at, this model includes relatively little information about the important factors that might predict how we'd move from one stage to the next. So while it's helpful to point out that those are important stages to pass through, it'd be helpful to have a little more information about exactly how does that happen? What are the critical factors or the um, important uh, uh, tasks that need to happen in order to move from one stage to the next? That's where the next model really has an advantage. This model is called the trans-theoretical model, uh, sometimes uh, also known as the stages of change model. And it's called the stages of change model because a central construct in this model is this idea of stages of change that are displayed on this slide here. The helpful thing about the stages of change model is that it helps us understand that no matter where people are in regards to a health behavior change, they are somewhere in that process. So starting at the top, you see pre-contemplation. Uh, pre-contemplation are folks who have no interest in the behavior change. They may not see it as relevant. They may not see it as a priority. They just have no interest. If we think about people who uh, smoke cigarettes, as an example, these would be the people who say, I don't have a problem. I don't need to change. I'm not going to. I'm going to smoke forever. That's people in what we call the pre-contemplation stage. The next stage is what we call contemplation. Uh, people in contemplation typically are ambivalent about the behavior change. On the one hand, they understand that they probably could benefit from some change and it might be necessary. But on the other hand, they realize it might be difficult, um, not the highest priority right now, maybe something they'll procrastinate and put off till the future. Uh, so these, these are people who feel kind of two ways about it. Maybe I should do something about it, but not right now. That's folks in contemplation. Uh, people then may move into the stage of action. Uh, the stage of action is people who are attempting to make the change. Uh, I'm doing my best to change right now, characterizes these folks. What's important about the action stage is that when people do this, when they are initially attempting to change um, a habit from an old behavior to a new one, it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of focus, a lot of vigilance, a lot of skill to keep that going because relapse is always a high risk. Um, if we talk about sort of the time frame for these different stages, people can be in pre-contemplation or contemplation for years, uh, decades, even lifetimes. Uh, taking myself as an example, um, I know that one of the changes I need to make is I need to drink more water. Um, I like to drink Diet Dr. Pepper, but I need to drink more water. I, I'm well aware of the health benefits, but I just can't quite do it. I can't make it a priority. I haven't convinced myself it's that important yet. And, and I've been stuck in sort of that place in regards to that behavior change myself for years. Um, someday maybe I'll move into action, but uh, not quite today. The action stage typically lasts for several months if people are successful at maintaining it. If we look at smokers, for example, the action stage lasts about six months. The reason we know that is that up through about six months, people are at heightened risk for relapse. If people can make it to six months without having a cigarette who've quit smoking, the relapse curve levels off, meaning that people are not that likely to relapse at that point. It starts to get easier for people after about six months. The next stage after action is maintenance. You might have recognized that term from the precaution adoption model as well. The maintenance stage is a stage where people are um, trying to keep it going, but it's much easier. It's becoming more integrated in who they are. It's more part of their normal routine. Uh, for smokers, we think this stage lasts from six months up until about two years. And the way we know it, it lasts until about two years is people are at heightened risk for relapse until about two years, certainly not as much of a risk of relapse as in action, but at some risk of relapse up until about two years. If we can get a former smoker to go two years without a cigarette, they really aren't at any greater risk at that point of relapsing and becoming a smoker again as somebody who has never smoked. And we know that if we have people in uh, middle to late adulthood, who have never smoked, they are almost, uh, it's very rare for them to take up smoking. So if we can get somebody to go two years without smoking, they've pretty much made it and they can move into the stage called termination, which is uh, the new habit is just uh, the new me. Uh, it's just a part of who I am is how you might express that. So uh, the new habit is now just the habit and the old habit is sort of passed and gone away. 
You notice in this model also that from action and maintenance, relapse is a risk, that people can lapse back into old behaviors and, and uh, go back to their old habits. That's what we call a relapse. If people can relapse back to either contemplation or pre-contemplation. Hopefully, people who lapse go back to contemplation. They still recognize they'd like to make the change someday, although it didn't work out right now. Uh, people could, though, relapse all the way back to pre-contemplation. If they're especially discouraged, they may go to pre-contemplation and just take the attitude that this is something I'll never change. That would be a pre-contemplation. So as you can see, this model includes people at any stage, all the way from not interested in change, all the way up through having maintained the change long enough that it's not even really a change anymore, it's just the new me. Um, and it helps us understand where people are, no matter where they are in that process. The most helpful thing about this model also is it has a lot of detailed information in the theory about what sorts of things are most helpful to people in moving from stage to stage. The things that are displayed in this figure here show that from those stages across the top, from pre-contemplation to maintenance, there are different what are called processes of change that can be especially helpful. So for example, in pre-contemplation, there's a process of consciousness raising. Uh, that's a process whereby people just receive new information and become more aware of an issue, perhaps learn more about the risks. And for somebody who's not interested in changing, that of course is a necessary process as a first step. Um, remember that precaution adoption model that had the idea of going from unaware of the problem to engaged in the problem. That's a, a process of consciousness raising that would move somebody from, from uh, those two areas. As we get into contemplation, you see there's self-reevaluation. Self-reevaluation is really taking that information that may be received at the pre-contemplation stage and really contemplating, how does this apply to me? Is this a behavior that I want to change for me? Does it matter to me? Is it something I value? And if so, then people might move into preparation or action. By the way, this figure includes that stage of preparation. I left that off the previous stage. That is sometimes left out of the model. Preparation is typically a very short-lived stage where people have decided they're going to make a change and they start preparing for it. So for example, somebody who decides maybe in mid-December that in January 1st they're going to start exercising. And so what they do in December is they go shopping for shoes and gym memberships. That would be the preparation stage. And then January 1st they would move into the action stage. But then in action and maintenance, you see there's lots of other processes that are helpful, things like contingency management, using helping relationships, or stimulus control. These are kind of behavioral self-regulation strategies that help one enact a new behavior change. And those are very helpful for people who are trying uh, to make a change. But those processes are not really useful to somebody in pre-contemplation or contemplation. So one of the real advantages of this model is it has these processes matched to these stages and helps us understand better how people can move. And that lets us also tailor interventions, what are called stage-matched interventions, to move people from one stage to the next. So this model is, because it has a number of advantages, perhaps the most popular model in health psychology today, it is very useful at crafting interventions. The blending of those stages with the processes help generate rich understanding of the change process and how it unfolds. And it also gives us lots of input in how we might develop stage-matched interventions. What we mean by that is simply that we develop interventions that have the right information, that have the right strategy, that use the right processes to match to a stage that a person is in to ideally help move them to the next stage and move them throughout the process. Uh, these stage-matched interventions in the literature have been found to be superior to, to generic one-size-fits-all interventions, although not in all studies. And I think one of the main reasons for that is that uh, the process of change is challenging, and uh, we haven't quite figured out the way to tailor for every individual how to move them through those processes. Those are, so those are the uh, change process models in addition to the uh, social cognitive models. Hopefully that gives you a good idea of the sorts of constructs and the way health psychologists think about uh, psychological influences on health and health behavior.